this hearing will now come to order, and I want to wish you a good morning and welcome to our subcommittee's hearing on one of the oldest and most important energy technologies available, advanced batteries and other storage uh, devices. As long as people have been gathering energy or generating energy, we've had an interest in storing it because so often uh, the rate at which we produce energy doesn't match the rate at which we use it. Also, there are times when we need portable power. We would not be uh, able to converse on cellular telephones, uh, work remotely on laptop computers, or shine a flashlight where we needed it without batteries. As our distinguished panel of witnesses will discuss today, batteries not only or are not the only technology for energy storage. Uh, there are others that uh, are not as commonplace, but have the potential to help us achieve a better match between energy production and energy consumption. Why is this important? Because renewable energy sources, wind and solar, do not produce energy on a continuous basis. These sources will become more viable if we can store the excess energy produced during times of peak wind and sun and release it as needed. Better energy storage technologies will also enable us to operate electric utilities in a more flexible and efficient manner. Energy storage can also help us respond to power outages more efficiently, uh, providing greater electric electricity reliability. This could be vital for maintaining operations at critical facilities such as hospitals during a natural disaster. We're all aware of the high costs and delicate negotiations involved when building new electric uh, generating capacity or transmission lines, especially when plants must be built to uh, meet the power requirements of peak demand. With better energy storage options, we can expand our options for new electricity Energy efficiency is the key to progress on three important goals, economic growth, energy independence, and a cleaner, healthier environment. New hybrid engines for vehicles have demonstrated how greater use of battery power can reduce fuel consumption and emissions. We can gain further fuel efficiencies and emission reductions, but this requires advances in battery technology and manufacturing far beyond uh, what we see today, even in conventional hybrids. This would also allow for more advanced vehicles, such as plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, to enter the market and finally bridge the gap between the electricity and transportation sectors. With both stationary and mobile energy storage, we cannot let an opportunity to establish a domestic manufacturing base for these technologies pass us by. And unfortunately, we may already be losing that race. New R&D activities with the Department of Energy are critical to advancing energy storage technologies, and we should pursue this aggressively to ensure U.S. participation in this field. Chairman Gordon is working on legislation to uh, support these programs at DOE, and the witnesses have been provided a copy of a discussion draft of that legislation. I look forward to, your, uh, to their comments and suggestions uh, to strengthen this bill and to accelerate our progress in energy storage. At this time, I'd like to recognize our distinguished ranking member, Mr. Inglis of South Carolina, for his opening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing on the status of uh, technologies that can accelerate the arrival of clean, renewable energy. General Electric uh, manufactures wind turbines in uh, South Carolina's 4th District. Inside that facility, as soon as one of the new cells is finished, it's put on a truck and shipped out. GE tells, um, tells me that the production line isn't slowing down. In fact, they're trying to add production capacity to meet increased demand, which is a very good thing for Greenville, South Carolina. These uh, wind turbines and other technologies, such as solar panels and vehicle batteries, can speed the growth of our renewable energy sector. But the energy storage question is a significant hurdle that stands in the way. There's no doubt that we can cross that hurdle, and there's no question that it will just that it will be worth it. Getting over the hurdle means not just clean exhaust from our cars, but consistent and stable energy supply to the grid, even when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing. That kind of reliability is what's necessary before these sources become commercially viable as alternatives to oil and gas, both at our power plants and in our cars and trucks. I'm looking forward to uh, learning from these two expert panels about how the federal government can help clear that energy storage hurdle. In addition, I'm also interested in fuel cells as batteries, and I'll return to that uh, in uh, question time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for um, this hearing, and look forward to hearing from our witnesses. 
Thank you, Mr. Inglis. Uh, and now I'm honored to recognize the author of this legislation, Chairman Bart Gordon, for his opening statement. Mr. Gordon. Thank you, Chairman Lampson. I want to really congratulate you and Ranking Member Inglis. You've had a very um, almost a forced march uh, first uh, uh, part of this year. Uh, our, the, our ranking and, and as well as the majority staff have done an excellent job. You've turned out good legislation. Uh, and I hope this can be maybe one more element that we can put on the menu for an energy bill. Um, for the future. And so, again, I thank you for your past work and I thank you for holding this hearing, uh, ensuring that the United States is competitive in energy storage technologies. And I understand the witnesses uh, have seen a discussion draft of the legislation I'm working on to accelerate the Department of Energy's energy um, storage programs and look forward to your comments. Many of us here agree that energy storage technologies offer significant economic, environmental, and security benefits. A recent study from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory determined that the short-term power interruptions cost the United States economy over $50 billion annually. Strategic deployment of energy storage systems could increase reliability of, of the grid and reduce the impact of these outages. Energy storage systems can also enhance the use of renewable energy sources, uh, diversify our energy mix, and lowering emissions. Broad deployment of energy storage technologies also can improve overall efficiency of the energy grid or the electric grid. Storing low cost energy generated at nighttime for use during high demand in the daytime makes sense. Energy storage is also critical for the next generation of vehicles, which will help reduce our dependency on foreign oil and lower greenhouse gas emissions. There's more work to be done to ensure batteries for electric cars are lighter, more powerful, and less costly. I also think that public-private partnerships can improve the production process for advanced vehicle components so that the U.S. becomes a leader in manufacturing these breakthrough technologies. So many benefits of energy storage technologies. I think additional federal investment uh, to research, test, and advance these systems should be a priority. And I'm very pleased that Ranking Member uh, or Ranking, the, our ranking uh, Member Hall uh, has also been interested in these issues and we look forward to working with him uh, to accommodate his interest uh, in getting a good bill together. And again, thank the witnesses for joining us today. Thank you, Chairman Gordon. Uh, I acknowledge the presence of a number of other members of the committee, and I ask unanimous consent that all additional opening statements uh, submitted by subcommittee members be included in the record without objection, so ordered. My pleasure to introduce our first panel of uh, witnesses that we have here with us. Uh, first is Ms. Patricia Hoffman, uh, who is the De Deputy Director for Research and Development and the Acting Chief Operating Officer at the Office of Electricity Delivery and Energy Reliability of the U.S. Department of Energy, long title. Uh, Mr. Brad Roberts is the Chairman of the Electricity Storage Association. Larry Dickerman is the Director of Distribution Engineering Services at American Electric Power. And Mr. Thomas Key is the technical leader for the renewables and distri distributed generation uh, at the Electric Power Research Institute. Welcome, each and every one. Uh, you all each have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Uh, your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing. When all four of you have completed uh, your testimony, we will then begin questioning. Each member will have five minutes uh, to question the panel. Often, we... Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to testify on behalf of the Department of Energy on energy storage technologies. The Department of Energy places great emphasis on the promise of energy storage and is researching a variety of storage technologies. Within DOE, Applied research into energy storage technology primarily occurs within two offices, the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy and the Office of Electricity Delivery and Energy Reliability. The department is committed to developing technologies that can help advance President Bush's 20 and 10 plan, a legislative proposal to displace 20% of expected gasoline usage in 2017 through the greater use of clean, renewable fuels and increased vehicle efficiency. The development and use of plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, PHEVs, will help us work towards the goal of this plan. PHEVs represent a unique opportunity for the nation to transition from using exclusively oil 
much of which comes from foreign sources, to fueling our vehicles, in part, with domestically produced electricity from the grid. High energy density batteries are key to the successful commercial deployment and development of these vehicles. Thus, EERE is researching lithium ion batteries, which have two to three times the energy density compared to the nickel metal hydride batteries currently in use for today's hybrid electric vehicles. It is clear that plug-in hybrid electric vehicles will have impacts far beyond the transportation sector and become an integral, although not always connected, element of our stationary electric system. When considering the potential impact of widespread use of PHEVs on our nation's en energy demand, it is essential to understand and address broader electric system impacts. For example, although ample generation capacity may exist on an aggregate scale to meet charging needs, how would PHEVs impact voltage regulation requirements? Or how would that generation capacity vary by region? Preparing answers today to questions such as these will allow PHEVs to successfully evolve from functioning solely as people movers to becoming stationary power sources for residential consumers to level loads and ultimately be a resource for the local utility. Stationary storage systems provide energy management, complement renewable resources, and can improve the power quality and reliability. This includes ride through of power quality events such as voltage sags that range in length from cycles to seconds, often seen as the dimming or flickering of lights. Additionally, energy storage can be an uninterruptible power source providing minutes to hours of electricity, and as such, can be viewed as insurance coverage mitigating risk. Whether an energy storage device is paired with a renewable technology or simply installed alone at a residential, commercial, or industrial site, it can serve a number of valuable functions, acting as a balancing technology to solve intermittent issues, serving as an uninterruptible power supply, or leveling consumers' demand. Energy storage and photovoltaic hybrid systems, for example, would provide customers the flexibility to charge their storage device and discharge their stored power in combination with the PV system to satisfy their peak demand requirement. To date, large-scale utility applications of energy storage in the electric system have not been extensive. Roughly 2.5 percent of the total electric power currently delivered in the United States passes through energy storage devices and is primarily limited to pump hydroelectric storage. The percentages are somewhat greater in Europe and Japan at 10 and 15 percent respectively. The strategic placement of energy storage systems could provide load leveling within a regional control area, reduce transmission congestion, and provide ancillary services such as spinning reserve, voltage, and frequency regulation. Energy storage is just one way to increase the reliability and resiliency of the electric grid. When storage devices are paired with so-called intelligent smart grid technologies, the grid could fully take advantage of renewable technologies allow for increased number of PHEVs and enable demand response. Like storage, smart grid technologies could have a revolutionary impact on our electric system. Smart grid technologies include smart appliance chips, advanced meters, and energy management systems located at the customer site, intelligent agents and controls on the distribution system, and wide area system monitoring on the transmission system are also considered smart grid technologies. The department also recognizes that fundamental, basic research into the future of energy storage materials and system is still required and can be a critical asset that accelerates our progress. One key opportunity the department is pursuing is a new approach combining theory and synthesis of nanostructure materials, which have been identified as, a key, enabling, as key to enabling the design of radically improved electrode architectures for superior power and energy density and increased lifetimes of energy storage systems. Portable electronic devices, which are enabled by batteries, are a form of energy storage, are now ubiquitous throughout society. When considering how widely accepted these devices have become in a relatively short period of time, one can only imagine the potential for storing energy at a much larger scale. 
Energy storage has the capability to reshape the way we fuel our cars, power our homes, and impact our nation's economic future. Federal investment in research, development, and deployment of energy storage technologies in combination with innovative policies and infrastructure investment has the potential to improve grid performance, reduce our dependence on oil, and promote our energy security, economic competitiveness, economic competitiveness, and environmental well-being. I am privileged to contribute to these research efforts and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. This concludes my statement, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to answering any questions you and your colleagues may have. Thank you, Ms. Hoffman. Mr. Roberts. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and the members of this subcommittee. Privileged to be invited, given the opportunity to share perspectives of the electricity. Trade organization found nation's grid and other ESA membership currently encompassing uh, 100 organizations, and in, which includes most of the major utilities in the United States leading manufacturers of energy storage systems around the world, technologists from academia, engineering firms, plus potential investors in energy storage. Over this period, ESA has worked very closely with DOE's energy storage program, Sandia National Labs, and various state agencies, such as the California Energy Commission, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, and the Electric Power Research Institute that is here today. ESA members have contributed key advancements to electricity storage technology using the very limited funds that have been available from DOE in the past. These activities have helped build a strong foundation for meeting the needs of a growing electrical grid that must now capitalize on the use of renewables sources and become more reliable, take advantage of smart grid technology, and be more uh, resilient to threats of any kind. This brochure that was in the package that was given to you shows examples of storage projects done around the world by ESA members. Studies and projects funded by DOE and state agencies have helped define the most significant use of energy storage. The most compelling are help control uh, power cost volatility, make more efficient use of fossil fuels like natural gas and oil to reduce dependency on foreign sources, benefit the performance of the transmission and distribution system nationwide, enhance the use of renewable energy sources and make them more dispatchable, help improve the overall performance of combined heat and power uh, systems, improve the grid's stability, reliability, and security. Very large-scale systems like pumped hydro have been successfully providing bulk storage for the overall grid for some time. But only recently in the few years have practical and affordable distributed energy systems have begun to appear. Storage systems can capture low-cost low energy at night and discharge it during peak daytime periods to help control price volatility. Storage systems can peak shave at the substation level and defer system upgrades. Small, fast-acting, dynamic energy storage systems such as flywheels can provide vital ancillary services to the grid such as spinning reserve and frequency control. Wind energy generation at night can be transported on lightly loaded transmission systems to load centers and discharged at peak times the next day. Further, great amounts of electrical storage in the grid can provide protected power to vital assets in the community, such as hospitals, airports, critical industries, such as data centers, communications facilities, and on. As the amount of storage grows and these resources become more widely distributed, the entire grid will become more secure and less vulnerable to man-made or natural disasters. Storage has been identified as a critical component for the future of smart grids and will play a vital role in demand-side management programs and make them work more eff effectively. The groundwork developed by ESA members working with DOE and Sandia has identified that we can realize with an what we can realize with an expanded incentive program at this time. Many technologies have passed the proof of concept stage and are ready for commercial applications and will provide real benefits to the grid. 
Some of the recommendations we make are expand the scope and size of government funding storage programs that interact with the grid, provide incentives to national producers of storage systems and key sub-assemblies of those systems, provide funding to demonstrate the benefit of both large-scale and short-term balancing uh, effects on wind power, provide funds to demonstrate the advanced storage, provide reliability enhancement for the grid, develop legislation to treat energy storage as a necessary component of renewable sources and provide federal uh, financial support to incent end users to develop and deploy storage systems. Also ask FERC to, to require independent system operators to allow new energy storage technologies to compete in the commercial markets and take advantage of their faster response. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Uh, Mr. Dickelman, you may proceed. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me here today. And also, thank you for the opportunity to provide the views of American Electric Power on the significance of deploying energy storage to improve security reliability, and performance of America's electricity infrastructure. My name is Larry Dickerman. I am the Director of Distribution Engineering Services for American Electric Power. American Electric Power is a 5 million customer utility in 11 states. We're one of the largest generators in the country, having 38,000 megawatts of capability. We are the largest transmission uh, utility in the country with 39,000 miles of transmission line. We are the largest distribution company in the country with 207,000 miles of distribution. But of particular importance for the committee members here today, AEP is leading the utility in U.S. deployment of large-scale energy storage. Of particular note is a success. AEP installed the first ever megawatt size scale NAS battery, sodium sulfide battery, in the Western Hemisphere in 2006. Based on our experience, AEP believes that storage has an important role in the grid of the future in that it can defer capital projects by improving utilization of existing assets. It can improve security and reliability. It can be deployed quickly, and it can work well with renewable resources such as wind. Also, we believe storage should be incented through mechanisms such as a federal tax credit in the range of 30 percent to accelerate widespread deployment. Over the last hundred years, AEP has been an industry leader in developing, advancing, and deploying new technology and has always recognized the value of storage as evidenced by our Smith Mountain Pump Hydro facility. Over the last decade, AEP tested and evaluated the feasibility of new battery and supercapacitor technologies in our engineering laboratories. Based on those tests, AEP decided to move it from the laboratory and into further uh, uh, prototype testing uh, with the sodium sulfide batteries for distributed energy storage system to support our grid. The major factors in selecting the NAS technology over alternative technologies were its safe and reliable commercial operation experience in Japan, compact footprint about the size of a double-decker bus, high efficiency and zero emissions, and you can relocate it if you need to. Based on successful laboratory and demonstration projects, AEP worked with NGK, and with SNC Electric Company to deploy AEP's first commercial one megawatt NAS battery in 2006 on a 12 kV distribution feeder in Charleston, West Virginia. This battery can provide enough energy for about 600 homes for seven hours. 600 homes for seven hours. As a next step, AEP also recently announced a new initiative to deploy more energy storage on its system. And this initiative includes six megawatts of additional NAS-based energy storage by the end of next year, at least 25 megawatts of NAS battery capacity by the end of the decade, and adding another 1,000 megawatts of advanced storage technology in the decade after that. The aim of these initiatives is to achieve many benefits, including reducing peak load on lines and equipment, providing backup energy to improve security and reliability, offering shorter deployment time versus traditional solutions, complementing the modern grid concept, and enhancing the use of wind generation at peak demand. Although this technology in most cases rests on the distribution side, that's physically where it's at on a distribution system, other benefits of energy storage extend to all parts of the electricity infrastructure, including helping to optimize generation. 
The Department of Energy played a critical role in helping to deploy AEP's project in West Virginia by covering the one-time engineering costs that were needed for this first-of-a-kind installation in the Western Hemisphere. The partnership of DOE and AEP to deploy the first ever megawatt-sized battery facility in the United States was an ideal way of taking a new technology from research and development to real-world operation to accomplish something uh, for a utility like AEP. Given the benefits of storage, AEP supports the continued development of storage technology and the adoption of incentives such as a 30 percent federal tax credit for deployment of distributed energy storage to accelerate the widespread use of storage to improve security, reliability, and performance of the United States electric grid infrastructure. Again, thank you for inviting me here today. Thank you very much. Mr. Key. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, distinguished members. Uh, representing the Electric Power Research Institute, I will focus on the role energy storage plays in the electric grid, both today and in the future. As a starting point, I want to recognize that uh, electric energy storage is both uh, valuable and expensive. Consider your retail electric rates uh, at home that are around 10 cents per kilowatt hour, yet most of us will gladly pay dollars when we replace a battery in a flashlight, our cars, or portable appliance. We think it's worth it. And it is much the same way in the electric power grid. We are generally willing to pay more to store kilowatt hours of electricity than it costs us to make them by conventional means. The key is to have the energy in the right place at the right time. And this is an investment that we are willing to make. Today, energy systems delivers our, our our uh, electric energy system delivers about 4,000 terawatt hours, and it runs with very little storage. I'd like to explain this. Uh, we are getting by without much storage because of the ingenious system of interconnecting many generators and consumers by forecasting demand, scheduling supply, and maintaining reserve generation as backup. If the electric, if electric load turns off in one place, uh, another one turns on somewhere else. In effect, we are running a massive just-in-time delivery system, and as we have seen, it can be tricky to keep the system balanced. We depend heavily on natural gas, fire generation, to both regulate up and down and to cover peak periods. Gas currently accounts for 47% of our supply capacity pump storage, our only significant uh, method for uh, electric storage, accounts for a little over 2 percent. In the future, we expect the situation to change. It will be increasingly difficult to operate this grid without additional energy storage. This change is our response to reducing carbon emissions, higher fossil fuel prices, and to able more diversified ways of generating and using electricity. We will need more energy storage to support the new mix of lower emitting and less controllable electric supply, including solar and wind, uh, but also nuclear and clean coal. We will need energy storage to enable a more effective participation by customers in managing their own use of, of electricity. One way storage can benefit the grid is improve to improve our use of the generators, the transformers, and the power lines. Currently, our utilization of these assets is below 50 percent. This is because of large variations in the electrical demand day to night and seasonally, and because of our practice of just-in-time delivery. To find large-scale storage options, EPRI is looking at new ideas related in compressed air systems to supplement existing hydro. This will allow us to use existing transmission lines much more effectively. On a smaller scale, distributed storage using batteries, uh, pumped water, or compressed air can improve grid asset utilization closer to the point of use. This is at a substation or feeder level. EPRI is working on a future smart distribution grid using distributed resources, including storage, to help manage electricity use. With more cost-effective storage technologies, we can increase efficiency and interact better with other new technologies, such as rooftop photovoltaic and plug-in hybrid vehicles. These new storage technologies will be needed to enable future solar and wind by giving our operators more options in balancing renewable supply and demand. 
cases are already documented where wind has challenged operators in New Mexico, California, and Hawaii. In all of these cases, storage is considered as part of the solution. I'd like to point out some challenges for uh, electric storage related to economics and risk. Costs are very high and siting and permitting can be difficult for large-scale storage. This is illustrated by the very modest amount of pumped hydro in the U.S. today. Energy storage by its nature creates value streams for several different stakeholders. With deregulation, it is difficult to aggregate the value and secure financing. This was illustrated by a compressed air plant that was not built to support West Texas wind in 2002. Distributed energy storage will require significant investment for development and demonstration. Uh, the utility industry is generally not in a position to make this investment. We believe that the DOE programs are on the right track to address the utilities' interests and that there are many more opportunities in the future to partner on first-of-a-kind applications in different regions and under different grid operating conditions. In the future, EPRI will continue to work with its members in the Department of Energy to help realize the untapped benefit of new energy storage technologies in the electric grid. We believe that the expanded use of energy storage is important to improving the efficiency, reliability, and security of the electric power network. Energy storage applications in both the transmission and distribution grid will be essential to meet the growing demand for electricity using low emitting technologies and gaining the full value of end-use energy management. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, I appreciate the uh, testimony. We'll now enter into uh, periods of, of questioning by members. I'll uh, <coughs> recognize myself as chairman for the first five minutes, and I would like to start with, uh, with Mr. Roberts. The Department of Energy has designated two national interest electric transmission corridors mid-Atlantic area and the southwest area. And these corridors include uh, areas of growing population and growing electricity uh, congestion. These designations have not been without controversy. Do you think that advanced energy storage systems could help reduce some or much of the need to build more electric generation and transmission lines? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I think it's essential that storage be applied in the load centers in the larger uh, cities in, the, in those regions. Uh, it will help relieve that congestion in the peak periods and will be very essential to making that happen and hopefully delaying uh, those upgrades for a long period of time, hopefully. Mr. Key, in your testimony, you state that another hurdle to energy storage deployment is the fact that the benefits are spread across a number of stakeholders, including power producers, system operators, distribution companies, end users, and society at large. Is there a role for the federal government to help bring stakeholders together to encourage investment in energy storage systems so the investment burden doesn't lie with one entity? I, I think that uh, we need help in that area. Uh, I, I haven't uh, prepared any recommendations uh, uh, related to uh, how the federal government might help, but uh, uh, it's very difficult to build large plants, um, and there is clearly benefits, uh, uh, aggregate benefits to the public to do this. Uh, we've seen that with uh, uh, our few existing plants that are uh, so valuable today, and, uh, and we're going to need more in the future. Mr. Dickerman, in your uh, testimony, you discuss what is needed to modernize the grid, including electricity storage devices and communication systems. In your opinion, do we need a new government body dedicated to facilitating or overseeing the modernization of the electric grid? Uh, the electric grid? I think uh, that clearly what's needed uh, in, in this whole area is some clear thinking about how all this fits together. If I might take a minute, I, th I think the kind of transition we're talking about here is very much like what happened with vehicles, where a vehicle in 1965 and one today is very different, and there's a lot of communication protocols, and there's a lot of um, computer capability, and uh, there's a lot of control of various devices that have optimized an automobile today. Now we're talking uh, this afternoon about the importance of storage and further optimization. It's a very complex thing that we're talking about doing in an automobile. 
an electric utility grid is far more complex in many respects in that there's so much of it and it all operates together and it operates in real time so we can improve the operation of the electric utility grid uh, substantially with communication and with control and dynamic optimization and storage but to do all that there's a lot of technologies that have to come together and it has to come together in a way that's common across the entire nation and so I do think that there needs to be some kind of group that comes together to really work through what does this look like and how do the technologies work together. Thank you. And for Mr. Roberts and Ms. Hoffman, several questions. Uh, as you know, power uh, generators provide a number of ancillary services to the grid to help, meet, uh, to help it meet reliability and operating standards. You both mentioned spinning reserves and frequency regulation requirements in your testimony on ancillary services. Uh, energy storage systems could provide to the grid. Ms. Hoffman also describes the department's frequency demonstration project in New York. In the future, do either of you anticipate energy storage systems playing a large role in providing vital ancillary services to the grid? Mr. Chairman, yes, I agree that storage systems will provide a large resource for frequency regulation, voltage regulation, and spinning reserves in the future. Mr. Chairman, I agree. Um, one of the issues at stake here is today um, the response time for the generating systems to respond to frequency regulation signals can be three or four minutes, whereas fast acting storage systems could respond in cycles, which would be more beneficial. It's stressful on, uh, on um, many large plants to do this up and down uh, regulation, and I think the, um, the power electronics that go with these types of systems adds uh, VAR control, which is um, reactive power control, as a side benefit of, of providing real power. So there's a real opportunity here, I think, to, um, to take advantage of these devices uh, to, to do those functions. Ask these last two things uh, together, and I'll just comment on them. Uh, outside the Department of Energy's demonstration projects, are states or regions adopting policies to encourage the use of energy storage systems to provide ancillary services to the grid? And are there benefits to broad adoption of policies that encourage the use of Both New York and the California Energy Commission have strong programs in looking at energy storage demonstration projects, as well as some of the demonstration projects that you've heard here with AEP and the Electric Power Research Institute. Um, I believe those are very strong pro programs in looking at the strategy for appropriate placement of energy storage systems. I would agree with her comments. Uh, those two states have taken a leadership role in this. I think other states are looking at how they might get involved, and I, I think the message is starting to, um, to spread around that there is real benefit here uh, at the state level. Uh, in the operation of the grids in those, in those regions, and, and it's going to improve. Thank you very much. I will now recognize Mr. Inglis for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm particularly interested in the um, storage of energy for transportation purposes. And um, in the discussion draft we have before us of the bill that we may be marking up soon, um, we talk about um, research on ultra capacitors, flywheels, batteries and battery systems, including flow batteries, compressed air energy systems, power conditioning electronics, manufacturing technologies for energy storage systems, and thermal, thermal management systems. I wonder if fuel cells are appropriately in that list. Uh, Ms. Hoffman, do you, you think so, or is it fuel cell appropriately in a list of batteries is essentially a battery you just put something in it and then it runs through and creates electricity could it be in the list fuel cell is a type of exchange so for storing energy um, it does use hydrogen as part of the fuel cell component I will have to get back to you on that. Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 I just wonder whether it might uh, might appropriately be in there. It is, um, uh, of course, you know, I'm I'm 
I've, I've talked a lot about hydrogen and uh, I'm very excited about its uh, potential applications to transportation. It's also true that batteries could um, be the competitor that wins a race to the car of the future. You know, if, if you have a really good battery, uh, then perhaps you don't need hydrogen either burning in an internal combustion engine like BMW wants to do it or um, or in a fuel cell like General Motors wants to do it. And I was very interested in this story recently about um, Lynn Motor Company using an ultra capacitor. I think they're based in Austin, Texas, and maybe manufacturer in Canada. I don't know if you saw the story, but they say that they have an ultra capacitor uh, kind of concept that will enable a battery to be recharged in five minutes and to take a car 500 miles on a charge. Are you are you familiar with that? Or I'm, I read the article and I thought, wow, this could be fabulous. Um, and then I saw some questions about whether it would really work. It's yeah, it just, what do you have any any thoughts about that? I don't have any comments on your specific example. I'll have to get back to you for the record on that specific example. But with respect to um, your comments on the types of vehicles and what horse is going to win the race, um, I think diversity is an important aspect of having for our vehicle fleet as well as our stationary sources. And I believe that in that diversity, there are options for fuel cell cars as well as plug-in hybrid electric vehicles in providing the diversity that the country needs. Yeah, and, and certainly it, it really doesn't much matter who wins the race, does it? I mean, as long as we can get away from what we've got now, which is a terrible way to get around um, in terms of the environmental benefits and national security risk that we're running um, and the job creation opportunity by creating these new technologies. So. Do you, do you think that, um, I don't know if anybody else wants to comment on whether they've seen that, uh, that or looked at the uh, ultra-capacitor technology involving that car. Mr. Roberts, you, have you seen that? Congressman, I'm, um, I've done some research. My company has done some research on that particular um, uh, thing you read about in that article. Right. And um, a lot of money has been invested in waiting to see when a, when a prototype is finally delivered. Uh, to see if these claims can be met, and uh, because they're pretty, pretty broad, yeah. and so uh, it's kind of stretching the, the the boundaries right now. But um, until some demonstration is done uh, to see, we won't we won't really know. I have a comment on the fuel cell usage and stationary application. Fuel cells are uh, uh, work very well, but they have no energy behind them. They have no punch. So. To make a stationary fuel cell really work effectively, you need to add some form of storage to it to give it the immediate energy it needs if there's a sudden load change or something, if you're applying it in an office building or something and the air conditioning turns on, the fuel cell can't deliver that, that surge of energy. And so storage actually enables fuel cells to, to work better. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we have tested uh, ultra capacitors and applied them and I would just just say that to drive a vehicle 500 miles there must be some other fuel involved uh, it's uh, it's, just, it's just not enough uh, energy I, I think today although the research is very interesting in this area and, and, and in fact we've done a lot of it uh, regarding fuel cells I, I don't think that uh, they're really treated as a battery or as a storage system. The, the storage, of course, is the, is the hydrogen or the natural gas that, uh, mm -hmm. fuel that goes into the, to the hydrogen. So uh, I think one problem with treating a fuel cell because it uses hydrogen as energy storage is that we have used hydrogen in, in internal combustion engines and, you know, in a from a tank of hydrogen. So there's a bit of a, a, a problem, I think, if you go down that, that route. I might offer a couple of comments as well. AEP has been involved with supercapacitors, and um, we have not seen results anything close to that. But what we have seen is that they have a real advantage in the fact that they can go through a lot of charge-discharge cycles, and we don't even know the limits yet. We've not been able to wear one out. So it, it's very positive in that regard. In terms of fuel cells, I think fuel cells and storage, uh, as Brad Roberts was uh, alluding to, a really great marriage because we are also working with fuel cell technology um, with Rolls-Royce uh, one megawatt size fuel cells for deployment on a utility grid. 
And the thing about the fuel cell is it really likes to run flat out. In other words, you turn it on and you run it at a megawatt and it doesn't want to vary. If you put a storage device with it, then you can take up all the variation and load with the storage device. So a two megawatt unit, one megawatt of fuel cell, a megawatt of storage, and then you've got something that can uh, sort of follow the load and the efficiency of the fuel cell uh, is very high. So I think it is an important technology related to this, and it's a technology that benefits from this. Thank you. Finally, I would recognize uh, Chairman Gordon at this time. He has uh, stepped out with, in the interest of Mr. McNerney, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank the panel for coming in today uh, with your testimony. Uh, storage is, uh, I think, critical to uh, global warming issues because uh, storage is going to allow us to utilize wind energy, solar energy, and other forms of intermittent uh, renewable energies on a large scale. Right now, we're not able to do that because of the intermittency problems. Uh, and uh, so I want to see uh, what we can do in terms of the federal, uh, federal government encouraging this kind of research. Uh, Mr. Dickman, you mentioned, uh, well, I'd like to know how you rate, uh, rate storage. Now, there's two ways to rate it, by the capacity, the installed capacity, so to speak, how much power it can generate and how much energy it can store, and then uh, how would you um, use that uh, to, uh, how would you use that economically to decide whether uh, a, uh, a storage technology is viable for a particular application? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think one of the issues with a technology like storage is that it's a fairly complex set of economics because you're talking about multiple benefits at the same time. So you can employ, uh, we can deploy a storage device to just shave a peak. So essentially what that gives you is about enough energy to serve uh, 600 homes for seven hours if it's a megawatt we're probably going to tend to be deploying more in the two megawatt size, so about 1,200 homes for about seven hours. So that's the basic rating. You can use it for just peak shaving. And then in that case, it might defer capital like a new station transformer or line upgrades or things of that nature. But we are also working now to island the technology, that is to make it such that if you lose the feed to an area, a rural area, imagine a remote rural area with relatively poor reliability, single feed, you lose the feed because a tree comes across a line, then the battery can continue to feed that area. So that has a value as well. And then uh, there's this value that is much harder for, for us to get our arms around that we were talking about uh, as it's just there a regulation value for um, uh, generation and uh, that type of thing. So th there's several things happening at the same time in terms of building up the value. So each of the projects we're looking at, we're sort of tailoring the economics and saying how much do, do we save in terms of deferring capital because uh, it reduces the load at peak, uh, what's the value of the reliability that we're gaining, and basically those are the two factors. We're not really yet to the point of trying to decide what is the value of some of those other uh, aspects that might benefit, benefit generation. Well, that, that's right. Um, with wind energy, which I'm familiar, uh, you have, uh, say, $1,500 a kilowatt installed, and then you have five to six cents per kilowatt hour produced. Uh, and I, I don't have a clear idea of how storage impacts those economics. It's specifically on wind generation? Well, wind, but it would be, you know, certainly the analysis would be uh, transferable, I'm sure. Well, in, in the case of wind, for example, uh, wind can probably um, be best thought of as a negative load. So load is something that you can predict somewhat, and you can um, follow load with the generation that you've got. But the generation we're used to dispatching, you know what it is. You know you can dispatch it. If it's 100 megawatts, you know it's available. You turn it on, and it meets a need. Wind generation, you don't know if it's going to be there because you don't know when the wind is going to blow. So there's an uncertainty. So it is uncertain in the same way that load is uncertain, and you have to follow load, and you also have to follow wind generation because you don't know what's going to happen. What the battery does is it enables you to store it and then make it available on peak when it means the most to you. And obviously the price, the real price of producing energy goes up 
as the demand goes up throughout the day. Um, Ms. Hoffman, you had said something that piqued my interest, uh, that we have 2.5% of our uh, energy in this country goes through storage and 10 to 15% goes in Europe. What are the uh, technologies they use in Europe uh, that allow that high uh, a percentage of their electric power to go through storage? How economic is that? Um, I believe I mentioned Japan. Japan did the first sodium sulfur battery, so they do have, it's the same suite of storage technologies that we are talking about here um, for the United States. And I'm sorry, I missed the other part of your question. Well, what's the, econ what's the economics of that? How, how much do they pay premium for that storage capacity? I will have to get back to you on that for the record. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, uh, the storage in Japan and the and uh, in Europe is pump storage, sir. There's very little uh, battery storage, you know, that, that would add up to percentages in the world. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. McNerney. Ms. Bigert, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Hoffman, uh, what are the origins of the NAS battery technology? I thought that this technology was developed in the, in the United States, uh, and did the did the government play a role in that development? I'm going to defer to Mr. Dickerman. Okay, Mr. Dickerman. The the NAS battery technology was developed in 1965, and um, uh, Ford Motor Company was involved. And uh, it was a technology that, uh, of course, was considered at that time as having possible application in vehicles. Uh, it was taken to a certain extent, and, and basically the technology then was um, uh, picked up by the Japanese and uh, a combination of NGK uh, with support of uh, Tokyo Electric, the Japanese government, um, uh, continued to develop it and uh, brought it to the kind of maturity to where it could be used in the uh, Japanese uh, electric grid infrastructure. Was it ever uh, used by the government, do you know, or the Department of Energy had any uh, research on that? That I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm just wondering because it seems like this is another example of uh, where uh, technology was d developed in the, in the U.S. and then commercialized and, and deployed by, uh, by foreign uh, companies and governments just like, um, like We've developed the nuclear uh, technologies, particularly the uh, recycling, and then it's been commercialized by France, and now they're selling this back to the United States. So, uh, and we're having to buy from overseas because we've uh, failed to capitalize on the inventions and, and the technology here. So, I, do you have any uh, anybody have any ideas about how to prevent this? How we can make sure. Uh, Mr. Roberts? Oh, I'm sorry. I'd like to comment on that. Uh, yeah, that part is true, but taking that battery energy and delivering it into the grid requires very sophisticated power electronic equipment, and we are in a leadership position in that field in the United States, and we've been very fortunate that we've developed that marketplace, and we're one of the leaders. My company is one of the leaders in that arena, and our initial developments and all of our work are a very good example of DOE programs that go back about 10 years ago. So, Mr. Dickerson? Uh, yes, I, I think there's really four stages to development of any technology. There's the basic research, and uh, quite often that involves um, academic institutions, uh, pure research kind of uh, programs uh, in various places around the country. Then there's applied research where you start thinking about what you can do with it. Then I think where things tend to break down is there's a need for demonstration projects. And at that point, you need to take the technology from something that's applied research like we did with this NAS battery or like we're doing with the islanding aspect of the NAS battery and actually do something that has to work and, and actually serve a useful purpose. And at that point, there needs to be a greater collaboration between industry and between uh, the organizations that are doing the research and understand the technology to create the real handoff as to how can you use this technology in a real way to accomplish a real purpose. And then once that happens, I think there has to be incentives for widespread use. And uh, what happens is quite often the technology initially, even if it works, is at a price point where it really isn't 
uh, competitive yet, and it needs an incubation period through some type of incentive. So basic research, applied research, demonstration projects, incentives for widespread use, uh, I think that's what's needed. And where things break down is in the demonstration project phase with industry, I think. So well, why did uh, AEP then need uh, DOE's help when uh, deploying that technology here when it's been it was in use uh, for 15 years in Japan? Because uh, it had not been deployed on a U.S. infrastructure, and the U.S. infrastructure had some fundamental differences in the power electronics that uh, Brad Roberts was talking about. And our vision from the start was to take it to a different level. So in Japan, the technology just sits there and peak shaves. And um, to even do that, we needed to develop the technology further to apply it on a U.S. system. The thing that hasn't been done anywhere in the world is to island this kind of a technology so that it can improve reliability and function with no connection to the electrical grid. That we're doing um, uh, for the first time in the United States anywhere in the world. And um, Ms. Hoffman, in your testimony, you, you talked about replacing oil, imported oil, to, uh, uh, to use d domestically um, produced fuel, electricity to fuel our cars. But if we continue to, and as a country that trended not encouraging gas or coal or nuclear for our electricity ener uh, energy and not allowing drilling for natural gas on the outer continental shelf or in Anwar, don't we run the risk of, of being more dependent on uh, foreign countries for natural gas. It seems like th so much of this is based on natural gas, which is really a commodity that, that we will run out of, and I think we need to keep it for you know the things that are really plastics and fertilizer and things that we will. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. The department is looking at advancing all the generation types that I think the United States is going to require in the future to meet that demand for electricity. And we'll continue to look at clean coal concepts, advanced nuclear, and renewable technology to the maximum extent possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Uh, the chair now recognizes Ms. Giffords for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our panelists who've come in today to talk about energy storage technologies. I'm excited, Mr. Chairman, about this topic because when I think about the challenges that we face as a nation and that the world faces, I think a lot of solutions to our energy needs can be talked about here in this room and hopefully put into action in terms of policy. This technology is important not just because of global warming, but because of our dependency on foreign well, and you know, figuring this piece of the puzzle out is, is going to be critical. I'm also really concerned, and, and um, Congresswoman Bigger talked about it, is our, this competitiveness issue that we're facing. We, we put money into research and development here in the United States, and then we see that technology furthered in other places. And, and that's got to change, and hopefully this Congress can be part of, of making that a reality. Um, I, a couple of questions. Um, I'm from Arizona. Everyone here on this committee knows because I always talk about Arizona. I'm very proud of my state. And it, um, the, one of the beauties that we have in the state, of course, is our abundant supply of sunshine. We have over 350 days of sunshine every year. So it's really solar energy that has the greatest potential for renewable energy in Arizona. I noticed, uh, Ms. Hoffman, in your written testimony, and even in the testimony provided by the other panelists, that there was no mention of thermal storage technologies. And that's obviously going to be critical for the development of solar power. So I was hoping that you would talk about this form of technology, what the Department of Energy is doing, and in, in each of your individual respective areas, where you see thermal um, storage um, development coming from, and um, whether or not these applications can be used in other areas besides the concentrating solar power, which we're seeing developed out in areas like Arizona. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thermal storage is an opportunity, and the department does not currently have any research programs in the area of thermal storage that I'm aware of. I will get check on that and get back to you for the record. But it does have potential for residential usage for thermal storage, and it can provide a balance um, with your photovoltaic system. So. so, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Hobbins, let me clarify. So you're not aware of DOE having any any research or any development into this area? At this time, I will check for the record. Yes. To comment on solar, 
energy and and uh, storage. Typically, around the country, solar energy peaks two to three hours before the load peaks. And if you apply storage, you can extend, capture all of that energy and extend it uh, into the evening and take advantage of that sunshine that was shining brightly in the afternoon when everybody was still at work. And so that's one of the areas storage can level, level out uh, solar energy and extend that uh, peak period in, to meet the peak period of the actual load itself. Thermal storage is of great interest to a number of our members in, in the West because of concentrating photovoltaic. Uh, in fact, we expect as much as five gigawatts of that type of uh, generation. And, and the thermal storage is a, is a na uh, very natural part of a, uh, a, a power tower, and it's also being looked uh, looked at and tried out for uh, uh, the trough technology. It's limited pretty much to the southwest, it's great, and it will be a big help uh, with with solar and, and, in fact, just balancing that uh, the western system, which is uh, has such long distances and, and uh, issues with stability. I, was wondering, I, I will clarify that there is a thermal storage with concentrating store, solar power in our energy efficiency office. I will have to get back to you with more details on that program. Would please, because Mr. Chair. You know, here again in in Arizona, you have a you have an area with large tracts of land, um, terrific sunlight, and also the um, scientists, University of Arizona, and other research institutions um, as well. The University of Arizona just announced a um, a specific program that's going to go um, basically a center for solar excellence that will be developed. And I, I think if we, we use that technology, we use the resources we have, we're, we're able not just to help the fastest growing state in the, in the nation, but also export that energy as well. Um, well. Let me just switch to another topic really quickly, which is the environmental impact of the storage technologies in general and batteries in particular. You know, as we try to develop more and more of this technology, and again, in a state like Arizona where we have a lot of hard rock mining and a lot of the environmental impacts, um, I was just hoping that the panel could address um, the, the ability to recycle this technology and also the increased demand for um, some of these precious and rare metals that are going to go into the storage capacity. I'll start the responses, Congresswoman. Um, all of the technologies, the battery technologies that are being used today um, are, are based on 100% recycling taking place at end of life in those, those technologies. Uh, that's something that's very important. Uh, the sodium sulfur battery is a hermetically sealed box. So there's no emissions associated with it. And so in, at the end of its life, um, it's totally recycled. And for the years of operation in Japan, there, there haven't been any environmental or safety issues. Most of what's in that big box the size of a double-decker bus is sand, and, uh, and uh, that's most of the weight. But uh, there really aren't any uh, environmental issues that, that we, Brad says, at the end of life we expect to recycle the components. You're welcome. Uh, recognize Mr. Portley for five minutes. Thank you very much. I must apologize for being called out for some of your testimony. I was really interested in, in, in hearing it. With uh, 10 kids and 16 grandkids and two great grandkids, I ask what I think is a rational question to those who would like to drill in Anwar and offshore. If you could pump Anwar and the offshore tomorrow, what would you do the day after tomorrow? And there will be a day after tomorrow. Wantonly consuming the small additional reserves that we have is not a prescription of security for tomorrow. Uh, Mr. Key mentioned the challenge that we have in getting batteries for, for cars that will get us very far. And that, of course, is because of the incredible energy density in our fossil fuels. One gallon of gasoline, little, still cheaper than water in the grocery store carries my Prius car 50 miles. How long would it take me to pull my Prius car 50 miles? This is incredible energy density. And to provide that, even anything approaching that energy density in batteries is a, is a 
horrendous challenge, and that's why this is such a difficult challenge. You know, in our aspirations for the future, we really need to be rational. And 20 in 10 is not rational. There isn't even a prayer unless we have a devastating worldwide depression with demand destruction that we can even come close to displacing 20% of our gasoline in, in, in 10 years. That is not going to happen. If all of our corn was used for ethanol and discounted for fossil fuel input, it would displace 2.4% of our gasoline. If all of our soybeans were converted to diesel fuel, they would displace 2.9% of our gasoline. That's, those aren't my numbers. Those are National Academy of Science numbers. And if we use all of our wastelands to plant to a mixture of grasses and use, and, and use the current hype, the, the uh, cellulosic ethanol, that might produce as much displacement of fossil fuels as all of our corn. So you add, up, you add up these three things, and you're way short of even 10%. You know, I'm all for, for, for doing something rational, but you know, this is an impossible dream, and I don't want to set us up for disappointment. We're going to be enormously disappointed if we think that we can even come close to displacing 20% of our gasoline in, uh, in, in 10 years. We can certainly reduce by far more than 20% of our consumption of gasoline in 10 years by conservation. I was in France at the last election. By the way, it's interesting that the new French president is the son of a Hungarian immigrant. He's doing a pretty good job, isn't he? Uh, and I looked there for people riding in a pickup truck as personal transportation. I saw not one. And I looked for people riding in an SUV. The only SUV I saw in Paris was parked behind a church. I did not see one on the street. If we really want to reduce our consumption of gasoline, we need to approach it rationally, not with, not with some impossible dream of continuing to drive these huge SUVs and pick up trucks, one person in them for personal transportation and displace 20% of our gasoline in 10 years. Am I wrong? I, I think I'd like to, Congressman, make one comment. Um, I think everybody agrees that that conservation and, and changing our ways has to take place. Along that way to that process, we need to use the energy resources we have much more efficiently. We're, we're adding a lot of wind into the system and to try to utilize it more effectively uh, as quickly as we can, uh, these these programs that uh, are listed in this bill, I think, would go a long way to helping that. Uh, but the the real problem is, I think, as you suggested, in that uh, things have to change and attitudes have to change. I'm a huge fan of wind and solar. I have an off-grid home. All of my electricity is produced by wind and solar. And I have a big bank of, of uh, lead-acid batteries to supply. But you must be very frugal in the way you use electricity if you're providing for yourself. There's nothing that will make you a better convert to conservation than producing your own electricity with wind machines and, and, and solar panels and watching how quickly that disappears if you're at all profligate. Thank you all very much for your, for your testimony and your helping to move us forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Bartlett. The uh, chair now recognizes Mr. McCall for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, Roscoe, I want to congratulate you on, on 10 children. I have five children, but you've managed to double the amount that I have. That's an incredible accomplishment. <laughs> uh, I, I want to uh, pick up on an issue that was discussed earlier, and that is uh, solar. Um, my home state of Texas also has a lot of sunshine. Uh, applied materials in my district is working on solar panels. Uh, making great progress with those, and the, the real issue is, is storage, uh, as you know. They they uh, tell me that, that the power grid can be used to, uh, that sort of their theory where they're going with all this is to store the solar energy from the panels into the power grid and then be able to draw upon the power grid. In other words, sort of getting credits for that. Is that a realistic uh, technology? Anybody can answer. Well, well, I think that is what we were saying, the complement of uh, storage and wind, 
uh, is that uh, you simply are taking it from something where you can't be sure when it's available, um, and you're storing it and making it available on peak, which clearly has a value. Uh, it sounds like that's uh, exactly what they're talking about doing with the uh, solar, and uh, so, so it's the same value proposition. Um, simply making sure that it's available in a dispatchable resource on peak when needed most. Now, Mr. Keith? Uh, the, the point that we'll use the electric grid to buy and sell to trade solar and, and wind energy is critical. Uh, uh, as I uh, described in my testimony, it's, it's, we're limited, I think, in doing that, especially as we take uh, uh, our regulation uh, type generation, um, natural gas, and uh, we try to move toward more nuclear and clean coal, and we add wind, and then it's going to be more difficult to do this trading and keep the system in balance. So uh, it's, it's a it, it, I think it's a correct statement, but it's a matter of how long we can uh, continue to do that as these renewable uh, resources come into play. And Ms. Hoffman, as I recall your testimony, you're not aware of any thermal storage research and development programs at the Department of Energy? Congressman, I was actually thinking of ice storage and some of those technologies when we were talking about thermal storage. We do have a concentrating solar power program that is tied with thermal storage, um, but I will have to get back for the record on details of that program. Okay. One more of limited time, the uh, hybrid uh, plug-ins. You know, we have hybrid vehicles. We have batteries. Uh, why? Just explain to me, I'm not a scientist, why, it's t why it takes so long to get a hybrid plug-in vehicle that could be available to the average consumer. If anybody knows the answer to that one. The next panel may be able to address right. that with the transportation. Hoffman, you'd probably be the best person to try to venture at that. I won't be around for the next panel. Yeah. Um, from the department's perspective in developing a, a vehicle, there is a development cycle that the manufacturers have to put plans for future vehicles, and I understand that cycle is somewhere around eight years to ten years. And so they're looking at now for technologies that will, they will introduce in the marketplace at a later time frame. Um, for the record, I can find out more on the, gener the development cycle de development for introducing new technologies into vehicle applications. I know we sponsored legislation for tax credits for that. It just seems to me that we should, that should be more in the short term than long term. And finally, Ms. Hoffman, have you ch had a chance to look at the, uh, at the proposed legislation yes, before us? Uh, there are two sections, uh, section six and seven, that deal with uh, demonstration projects at the Department of Energy. Um, can you comment on these two? sections and whether, and also whether there uh, is any uh, duplication uh, between these two programs? From a technical perspective on the, the content of there, I think it's very synergistic to where the department is heading, where the states are heading, and where other research programs are going for the types of demonstration projects. So for an area of completeness, I think the bill does capture both of those aspects. Um, so you see them as complementing, not uh, du duplicating. Is that fair? Yes, sir. And finally, uh, intellectual property is going to be a, a real issue uh, if advanced technologies are discovered through these joint activities. Do you have any uh, thing in place to uh, protect intellectual property? The department does, and I would have to get back to you for the record on that one. Okay, that'll be fine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Rakin, I recognize you for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just, uh, I didn't know uh, of the different uh, witnesses. Do we have anybody that's on top of um, where we are in terms of battery technology and that developmental process? Uh, my background's in engineering. Um, my sense is, is that maybe one of the shortest paths to, uh, to solving some of the dependence on foreign oil is using the off-peak power from the... Uh, uh, whatever, whether it's coal or nuclear generation, and being able to put that right into a car, also has the added benefit of not paying any fuel tax, which I like. But uh, anyway, what's the what's the status of battery technology? I understand basically the answer to my friend's question here is that it's too expensive. The batteries are too expensive; they don't last that long, and just economically, it's cheaper to burn gas. But, but the question is, where is that technology? Because certainly it's come a long way in 10 years. I mean, I remember when they came out with that first electric-powered, uh, you know, screw gun or, or drill, 
and, and the thing was not much power to it. Now they've got you know these these big hammer drills all running on batteries. Or, 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 or is that continuing to move or not? Congressman, um, unfortunately, um, in the afternoon session, there's uh, a battery manufacturer that's here that could address that probably a little better. But there's a lot of activity in research and development of advanced batteries, uh, particularly for vehicle application, in the going on in this country right now. And uh, uh, that's I'm, not your expertise, particularly. No, no. no. Okay. Well, that's all I had for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. I don't. I think everyone has had their opportunity to ask questions, and we do have a second panel. Uh, we want to thank you very much for, for coming. Uh, I will, as, uh, in, in closing, ask, are any of you aware of anything that has to do with wireless transmission of energy? And if so, I'd like to talk with you. Uh, uh, again, I thank you all for, uh, uh, for coming. We'll take a short break. Uh, it will be in recess before our next panel uh, comes up.
Committee will come back to order. Uh, we'll now hear from our second panel. Uh, includes Ms. Linda Ziegler, uh, who is the Senior Vice President for Customer Services at Southern California Edison. Ms. Denise Gray, who is the Director for Hybrid Energy Storage Systems at General Motors. Mary Ann Wright is the Vice President and General Manager for Hybrid Systems Power Solutions at Johnson. You'll each have five minutes for your spoken testimony. Your written testimony will be included in the record for the hearing, and when all three of you have completed your testimony, we'll begin with questions, and each member will have five minutes to question the panel. Ms. Ziegler, we will begin with you. Could you, could you turn on your mic? Advanced Battery Technology. Um, at Southern California Edison, we are the largest purchaser of wind. We purchase over 2,700 megawatts, and we also purchase 90% of the solar generation in the country. My company has been committed to the electrification of transportation for 20 years. We operate the nation's largest and most successful fleet of electric vehicles, a fleet that has traveled nearly 15 million miles on electric power. Our electric vehicle technical center, unique in the utility industry, is one of only several facilities recognized by the Department of Energy to evaluate all forms of electric drive technology. We have ongoing research collaborations with major automakers, battery suppliers, and both the federal and state governments. We believe that with continued engineering advances and appropriate public policy support, the widespread use of advanced batteries in plug-in vehicles and in stationary storage applications will become one of the nation's most effective strategies in the broader effort to address energy security, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and reduce air pollutants. In fact, the Electric Power Research Institute, which we heard from earlier, and the Natural Resources Defense Council recently partnered to publish one of the most comprehensive studies to date on plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. One key finding was that widespread adoption of plug-in hybrids could reduce annual emissions of greenhouse gases by more than 450 million metric tons by 2050, or the equivalent of removing 82 million passenger cars from the road. That kind of reduction is obviously a long way off, but it provides all the more incentive for us to begin today. Electricity is virtually petroleum-free is about 25 to 50 percent the cost of a gallon of gasoline equivalent and is the only alternative transportation fuel today with the national infrastructure already in place. A recent study by the U.S. Department of Energy estimates that a little over 70 percent of the light duty cars and trucks on the road today could be fueled by the excess off-peak capacity that exists in the electricity system without building a single new power plant. For utilities such as Southern California Edison, the challenge and opportunity is to integrate electric transportation and their advanced batteries into a total energy system. In the near term, the advanced high energy battery in a plug-in vehicle could serve as a source of temporary emergency power for the home or to occasionally help customers avoid high electricity costs during peak pricing times. We call this vehicle to home. These same advanced high-energy batteries could also be used in stationary applications. Homeowners could fill a home energy battery at night using low-cost electricity and then draw from it during the high-cost part of the day to help lower their monthly utility bill. In the midterm, as plug-in vehicles increase in volume, using the grid's off-peak capacity at night to charge these vehicles may actually help lower customers' rates by increasing the utilization of our generating plants. In effect, utilities would spread their fixed cost over more kilowatt hour sales. To evaluate new business models on these and other applications, Edison recently launched a partnership with Ford Motor Company to demonstrate and evaluate purpose-built plug-in hybrid Ford Escapes. Our goal is to explore the future customer values delivered through plug-in vehicles and stationary energy storage. At the same time as the emergence of plug-in vehicles and home energy storage is the advent of advanced utility meters. Over the next five years, Southern California Edison will install five million next generation advanced meters called Edison Smart Connect in the home of every customer in our service territory. These meters will offer our customers better information and enhance control over their electricity usage. 
Our Electric Vehicle Technical Center is working with industry stakeholders to integrate the vehicles and the home and the advanced meter. Finally, in the long term, we can imagine the potential of so-called vehicle-to-grid systems or the ability to move stored energy from many plug-in vehicles back to the grid. The potential, however, of vehicle-to-grid is many years away and will depend on the development of all new control technologies as part of the smart grid of the future. Is that anything I should worry about? <laughs> um, Okay, now let me conclude with our view on the important role the federal government can play to bring the promise of electric transportation closer to reality. In our opinion, large-scale domestic manufacturing capacity for high-energy advanced batteries is critical to the expansion of plug-in hybrid vehicle applications and complementary stationary energy storage uses. There currently exists no such capacity on a significant scale in the United States today. The federal government should provide near-term incentives to help nurture U.S. production of this critical technology. And earlier this year, H.R. 670, the DRIVE Act, included important measures to support research, development, and demonstration of advanced batteries in plug-in hybrids, battery EVs, and stationary applications, as well as R&D for other aspects of electro-drive technology. This language was then improved this summer by battery makers, automakers, and other stakeholders, and has now passed the Senate as H.R. 6, and parts of the DRIVE Act have passed the House as H.R. 3221. We support this language and look forward to working with your committee to explore other effective national manufacturing and consumer incentives to set the stage for the breakthrough of plug-in vehicles and energy storage in the U.S. marketplace. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, we stand committed to partnering with all automakers, battery suppliers, stakeholders, and government to help realize the vision I have laid out for you today. Thank you very much. You're welcome, and thank you. Uh, for those of you who don't know, those were our equivalent in the Science Committee of bells uh, for votes. Uh, so uh, we will have votes in just a, in just a few minutes. Uh, we'll proceed on until we have to leave, and we'll be watching the number of people for those votes. So at this time, we'll call on Ms. Gray for five minutes. Of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of General Motors. I am Denise Gray, Director of the Hybrid Energy Storage Systems Department. I direct the development and the production of energy storage systems for GM with a focus on developing and qualifying new battery technology solutions. For 100 years, the global automotive industry has run almost exclusively in oil. Tomorrow's industry will not. The solution, alternative sources of energy, along with new technology to allow automobiles to run on tomorrow's fuels. But what fuels and what technology? At GM, we believe that no one solution is right for every part of the world or even every co consumer in, every, in any given market. So our approach is simple offer as many choices as possible to as many consumers as possible everywhere we do business while offering the best possible fuel economy for whatever type of vehicle our customers choose. Our vision moving forward is to reduce petroleum dependency and greenhouse gas emissions by displacing oil with biofuels and electricity as well as enhancing vehicle efficiencies. And we have developed a comprehensive advanced propulsion strategy to meet these challenges. We're continuing to make in incremental improvements in the efficiency of conventional vehicles. We're continuing to expand the portfolio of flex fuel vehicles, ramping up to 50% by 2012, provided the fuel infrastructure and supplies are available. We're continuing to expand the portfolio of hybrid vehicles that we offer with five hybrid model models available this year and more coming next year. Most relevant to this hearing, we have started a plug-in program for our Saturn View Green Line two-mode hybrid, followed by the introduction of our Chevrolet Volt concept vehicle. And finally, we, continue, we are continuing to develop hydrogen-powered fuel cell vehicles and the infrastructure needed to support such vehicles, with the largest market test of fuel cell vehicles to date beginning later this month. As I mentioned earlier, this year brought the announcement of the game-changing Chevy Volt our first demonstration of an innovative new GM propulsion system called EFLEX. The E stands for electric, 
because all the E-Flex vehicles would run on electricity. The, the flex in E-Flex e is flexible because the electricity can come from many different sources. GM's E-Flex system is simpler than hybrids because it's purely electrically driven. Electricity is stored in the battery pack and used with electric motors to drive the, to drive the car with the electricity from the battery obtained in two different ways. First, you can plug in your vehicle and your common electrical outlet to recharge the battery. This allows the vehicle to operate as a battery electric vehicle. Second, once the battery charge from the electric utility grid is depleted, the battery can also be recharged by a simple engine generator set or fuel cell. This allows you to extend your vehicle's electric driving range to several hundred miles. Let me turn to our battery technologies. There are really two types of batteries that we require. The one most people are familiar with is charge depletion. Think of this as a flashlight that depletes its energy when used. And then you can either dispose of it or you can recharge it. It is the rechargeable version of this battery that we are most interested in for plug-in hybrids. This is a new idea that, and this is a new area of focus for the US ABC. The other type of battery is known as charge sustaining. These batteries are designed to accept and deliver power while maintaining a constant state of charge. They never deplete. Charge sustaining batteries are used in hybrids on the roads today, such as, such as our Saturn Aura hybrid. They store up energy captured during braking and reapply it to help the vehicle accelerate. Charge sustaining batteries have progressed to the point where many OEMs are able to offer these hybrid vehicles. We owe much of this success to the work of DOE and USABC with the supplier community. For plug-in vehicles, we, are really, we really need, which, which we need, really need are high energy charge depletion batteries that also has power, so we're looking for both of those attributes. To bring these new energy hybrid batteries to market, GM is using a multi-phase process which starts with qualifying these lithium ion cells. Then we develop these, we, test, we go through a number of different tests as a battery pack uh, with, with performance attributes such as life, um, durability, reliability, and finally we work through our vehicle integration process to make sure that these batteries can live in our vehicle, in our vehicles. As this work is necessary uh, as a precursor to a solution, implementation ready, and planning into our production programs. Again, I must um, make sure that with these points in mind, we have to follow the various concepts, if you will, that, that are outlined in our various, our various plans. Again, with this, I stop and look forward to your questions. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Ms. Gray. Ms. Wright, you're recognized for five minutes. And, and at the conclusion of that, we do have three votes uh, and uh, we'll be in recess long enough for us to make those votes, probably half an hour. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, it's a pleasure to be here. And my hope is when we all walk out of this room for you to go vote, that you'll have a better understanding of what the state of play is for battery technology and how we're applying that battery technology into the various hybrid applications. Um, before joining Johnson Controls, I was with Ford most of my career where I was the chief engineer of the Escape Hybrid. And Mr. Inglis, I was also the uh, chief engineer for the fuel cell program and the hydrogen internal combustion engine program. Um, so I'm going to do two things today. One is, what is the state of play of hybrid battery technology? And what's going on relative to putting that technology into the vehicles? Um, as Denise said, on the road today, we have a lot of hybrids. Um, they're powered by nickel metal hydride uh, batteries. And I have to tell you, as an industry, we've done a really good job of creating acceptance and confidence in the technology. They're reliable, they perform well, they're safe, and they deliver really good fuel economy and lower emissions. <clears throat> but like anybody's technology, your iPod or anything else, te technology continues to move forward. Now what we're doing is you're seeing this journey go on from nickel metal hydride to lithium ion. And it's, it's the right step. They're smaller, they're more powerful, they're lighter, they're equally safe. And the expectation, obviously, is the economic benefits are going to come along with them as well. And along with all those benefits, you get better fuel economy, better emissions performance because they're lighter. Weight is the evil in a vehicle for fuel economy. Now, not all hybrids are alike. At the break, we had an interesting discussion. And one of the things I want everybody to understand is there are several different types of hybrids. 
We have hybrids that are on the road today, readily uh, available for all of us to purchase and drive. Uh, Mr. Bartlett drives his Prius, I have an escape. Starting with the stuff that's here today, we have micro-hybrids. Those are basic start-stop function hybrids. They're widely available in Europe. In fact, Johnson Controls will put over 400,000 of these batteries in vehicles this year over in Europe. And they have a pretty good um, efficiency rating of about 10% fuel economy and CO2 reduction benefits. Moving up the spectrum, we have mild hybrids. That you would probably think of as a Honda Accord. Uh, delivers about 30% improved fuel economy and emissions and provides a bit more functionality, as Denise said, regenerative capability. And then finally, we have the full hybrids. Um, and an escape hybrid, a Toyota Prius, or a full hybrid. You can propel the vehicle on electric power alone, which clearly would provide increased uh, economy relative to fuel consumption as well as reducing CO2 emissions. All of these are on the road and available today. In fact, uh, Johnson Controls next year will be putting our first lithium-ion batteries in the Mercedes S-Class, which will go on sale in the United States in 2009. And they also are uh, ready to go into the full hybrid. You take the journey a bit further, now we're talking about plug-ins and pure EVs. And there's an awful lot of, deservedly so, excitement about the opportunity with plug-ins. Um, they're very promising, significantly improved fuel economy and emissions. I mean, literally, you can have zero emissions and, and very, very high uh, fuel economy ratings. <coughs> Lithium-ion clearly is the enabler just because of the physics of the battery. They're smaller and lighter because of all the energy that's going to be required to be able to propel these vehicles. Just as the lithium ion is the enabler, it's also the biggest technical challenge that we have on the table. And it's working with my customers, such as Denise, to try and overcome these challenges as an as industry. <clears throat> now, in Johnson Controls, we have a lot of partnerships um, in play right now with GM on the Saturn View, uh, with Southern Cal, with Ford Motor Company on a plug-in fleet, and clearly all the great work that's going on with USABC, as well as the Chrysler Sprinter vans that are going on sale next year. We're going to solve these technical problems. I'm absolutely convinced of that because I sat in this seat about four years ago talking about hybrids and just getting them on the road. But then what you're faced with is what are you going to do about the cost and the economics? We've got to get the scale up. We have to get standards. We have to put a recycling infrastructure in place. We need domestic manufacturing capability. We have to establish a diverse supply base outside of Asia. So in conclusion, this we are confident we're going to be able to get to commercialization by solving the technology and working towards these cost drivers. But it's going to take federal government assistance. We're going to need to continue to fund research, and not for just the stuff that we're doing today. Clearly, we need that. We need demonstration fleets. We also need to fund the next great breakthrough, because just like lithium-ion was a breakthrough, next is going to be something else. Um, the, the consumer and manufacturing incentives are, are sure enablers to help us with this. Uh, funding manufacturing investment and in infrastructure and supply-based de development. We have to facilitate collaboration between the industry, our federal la or our government labs, the automakers and the utilities to see this all come to fruition in a way that we can see mass commercialization. So in summary, recognizing that you all need to go and vote, thank you very much and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. We will stand in recess for our votes. See you shortly.
the cost of energy storage devices, especially lithium, um, will decrease as we learn how to build them more efficiently, high quality, and we get the volume up. And so I do agree that it is time to begin thinking about how do we learn how to manufacture lithium ion batteries, learn how to do it now at low volume, and then begin moving that volume up so that we can get the, the quality up and the cost down. Well, the, it was the, the, the automobile industry practically invented high volume manufacturing. Why is the federal government uh, needed to ex accelerate industrialization in this area? And, and what can DOE do uh, that the industry cannot do? Both of you, uh, either of you. Okay. Well, actually, I came with a whole list of specific projects that I would go and talk to um, my friends at DOE about relative to high volume manufacturing. Um, we are presently completing the construction of our first lithium ion facility in NERSAC, France. I wish I could say it was NERSAC, Maryland or something. Um, and one of the things that we're learning is that we have good capability to produce good quality hybrid cells, but it is not at the level that we need to be to be producing them in the quantities and in, at the cost levels that you do for cell phones and for laptop computers. Um, we know very well the kind of help that we need, that we need help from the government labs, DOE, and other federal uh, resources. And I'd be delighted to share those specific projects with you that would in, indeed enable us here in the United States to be able to get a leg up on the high volume manufacturing at affordable costs. Okay. To drive down costs and to spur development of advanced batteries in the U.S., you propose a partnership, uh, Ms. Wright, between federal agencies and the battery manufacturers and lower tier suppliers. Let me ask you. Let me ask you three questions. Do these partnerships not already exist in the form of groups like the U.S. Advanced Battery Coalition? Does the DOE partner directly with the battery manufacturers and lower tier suppliers in R&D projects, or is it mostly uh, conducted through partnerships with automobile manufacturers? Third, is there a need for diversifying the pool of participants in, in federal vehicle-related R&D? Um, you know, clearly we do have partnerships that are established, and they're good partnerships um, through DOE funding, USABC, uh, Freedom Car. Those those are all great uh, forums. Um, but I, but I would I would suggest to you that what we need now is to really look at it in two pieces in terms of improving our partnership. One is being able to take the technology that, as Denise said, is ready to go forward and be commercialized in high volumes at affordable cost and, and uh, support that as an industry with the automotive ma manufacturers, the battery uh, suppliers, and the federal government, including the labs, who can help us with the intellectual property generation, and get those into demonstration fleets to absolutely uh, build the confidence and the capability to do it on a high volume. The second piece, and this is where I don't think that we have the emphasis that we need, that is the what comes next. Um, we, f we tend to focus too much on getting through a specific project rather than we'll solve this, but what's going to come after that? Because I assure you, everybody else in the world is already thinking about that. And I think in terms of uh, we, the partnerships really are through the USABC in, in terms of our day-to-day -day interaction. So the direct work really comes through USABC at the direction of DOE. I would encourage more direct uh, interaction between DOE, the automotive manufacturers, the industry, as well as the suppliers. And then finally, I think you had a question on diversi diversification of who should be involved. I wrote as fast as I could. <laughs> I talk faster than I can write. Yeah, find a pool of participants uh, in, uh, uh, in in vehicle-related uh, R&D. I think you know we we actually are in, in fairly good shape relative to who's participating mm -hmm. in these you know in these established forums. Um, and I think clearly, if you take a look at how the automotive manufacturers are partnering up, they're taking advantage of everything that's available to them. Unfortunately, there's only a few of us that are here based in the United States. If I can add in that area as well, I think USABC, DOE has done an excellent job thus far getting us to where we are, but our product is still high cost, 
Our product still doesn't have the quality it needs to go. We need to take a step change. We need to take a step change in, in allowing us to understand more apparently how these applications are going to work, learning cycles. We can stay in the research, we can stay in the what if kind of mode for a while, but in order to really get to a commercialization of where this has to go, you've got to have demonstrations, you've got to put the product, you've got to manufacture the product, and you've got to have exercising uh, activities from a learning perspective. And the cost of these energy storage systems, these batteries, are high in the beginning, and you've got to have means by which you get some quick learning cycles, and then you've got to have a, a means for the customer to be able to buy these kinds of things. So they've got to have some incentives to bring it down so the customers don't assume all the cost, but then rapidly, at the same very time, you've got to build up your manufacturing capability in the states in order to contain, continue and sustain that cost curve. Because if you don't do that, you'll end up having one system that works and all of a sudden it's gone away and technology has passed you up. Uh, I'll call on Mr. English and then I'll come back and ask uh, a second. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we're here at the Science Committee and you know we're, we're very excited about science. Um, it's also true that it can be a science project until the market sort of drives things along. Um, and so the goal being to break our dependence on foreign oil, the goal being to create jobs by inventing new technologies, and the goal being to clean up the air. Um, I think it's very helpful testimony you're giving because it is it is about the market. And so, Ms. Gray, the, the, maybe you could talk a little bit about General Motors' hope of either is it is it hydrogen or is it volt um, or is it it doesn't matter either, either one works for for General Motors as is, is a manufacturer here what do you, what do you see is the market's acceptance of those and uh, help us move from a science project into something that's really going to transform the the fleet you know when we put out the Chevy Volt earlier this year, I think that was a means to bring these kinds of things together. Because number one, we've got a battery, a high voltage storage device that allows you to mate that up with an internal combustion engine. So when the battery gets depleted, you can use the, that, the, the internal combustion engine in order to replenish the battery. But you can also use a fuel cell in that same configuration, if you will, in order to provide uh, power, if you will, energy for that battery to store it and to use it appropriately. It really was a way that we pulled all of these technologies together. So it's not a either or, but an and, in order to allow us to have the diversification, uh, if you will, from petroleum. So really there's a place for both of them, depending right. upon uh, the needs and the use and the accessibility of the various uh, energy devices. Well, that, that said, capital is generally limited. In other words, you got to allocate resources within a, um, you know, uh, a company. Or if, so, you you think you'll be allocating them? Where do you think you'll be allocating them? It, don't tell me anything. You got to shoot me after you tell me anything, <laughs> or call the SEC lawyers if you got to say something. If you got to before you answer, but I guess it's a public forum, so you can probably tell me. Uh, Allocation of resources have been uh, applied for both areas, quite frankly, and for all the areas. Um, I was telling one of the, uh, the constituents a, real, a little while ago, back in the, early in the late 90s, I worked on ethanol. Uh, currently, I'm working on energy storage devices in fuel cells, and I'm com coming up with uh, requirements for fuel cell vehicles with an energy storage device, and I'm also coming up with requirements for an internal combustion engine, again, to replenish the battery when needed. So we have resources allocated in all of those areas. Um, I was also trying to advertise it that uh, we're still hiring because for some reason people think that we're not um, adding resources in these particular areas, but that's so, so incorrect. We've been hiring over the last 10 years in areas that allow us to increase our fuel economy through regular conventional vehicle efficiencies as well as diversification, be it biofuels, fuel cells, energy storage devices. If you looked at where GM's been hiring, if you will, over the, the last 10 years, it's been in those areas so that we can meet the need of what, where, where we have to go. So the answer is all of the above. 
Ms. Wright, you got a prediction about which one's going to win? Well, I was going to ask you if I could make a comment yeah. if you didn't invite me. Um, I think it's really important for everybody to understand that, you know, one, it's a journey. So you're going to learn and we're going to increase hybridization, increase electrification. And there's going to come a point where it's not going to matter what is actually providing the fuel. You will always, always, always have an energy storage device. So I'm, in, I'm employable for a long time because you're always <laughs> going to need an energy storage device. Now, what shape and form it takes, what the chemistry is, who knows? What's really exciting about that, though, is we are done, and I used to be called a science project at Ford with my escape, with the hybrids and with yeah. the fuel cells, is we're now seeing a convergence in exactly what GM is doing, and that is regardless of what the power plant that Denise is told to provide an energy storage for, she doesn't care. She's going to be able to provide an energy storage device that will fuel anything. And so as we get better and smarter with um, ethanol and internal combustion engines and diesels and fuel cells and pure electrification, it's all going to be a journey that we're going to drive standards, drive the cost down, and, and eventually we'll have a whole portfolio of stuff that we'll be able to. So I didn't answer your question. I'd be a good politician, wouldn't I? <laughs> well, so I, I don't think there is a winner. I think the winner is the battery. Clearly. That is helpful. Now, I have heard uh, from some people that uh, see hydrogen as a future, that hydrogen or, or an electric, a pure electric, would be far more uh, simple to manufacture and to operate than a hybrid. I've heard the objection to hybrids that they are actually very complicated systems. In fact, I've seen it laid out how many pieces are in a hybrid as opposed to how many pieces would be in a fuel cell vehicle. And it's really an interesting layout. Um, and the idea being, you know, you, you put all that complexity in a vehicle and you drive it a couple hundred thousand miles, a lot of those things are going to break. Um, and so the simpler the better, right? So I agree that you got to have a storage mechanism, but you want to get it as simple as possible, right, and cut out that some part of that so you can get to simplicity. Well, I, I, I do agree with you. Um, and if you take a look at the complexity of a hybrid system, you have essentially nine intelligent systems that are all trying to play nicely in the sandbox, right, and right. operate as a cohesive system. But what you have to take, and this is where we get into Linda's uh, expertise, is you're right. Denise said EVs are inherently more simple. But then you have to take a look at the total picture, and that is, how clean is the energy source for which you're driving that electric vehicle? I mean, so we get outside of the fundamental uh, technology of the vehicle, and then you have to start looking at it more globally. So I would just I, I would um, suggest to you that, yeah, we want to drive to electrification of vehicles, and with or without a fuel cell, we, you know, we can debate that. Or, but I do think then we have to expand and say, how are we going to ensure that the energy sources aren't worse than the cure of those vehicles for which we're propelling them? Yes, I just did want to add the um, study that was done by EPRI and NRDC, and they looked specifically at plug-in hybrids. In all scenarios, even with the current mix of generation, which doesn't include any you know, coal gasification or anything like that, there was greenhouse gas benefits in all cases. And then if you look at as the electricity industry moves to, you know, low, lower carbon generation, you get much more greenhouse gas savings. So even with, and this was study on the plug-in hybrids, not pure electric vehicles, but in all cases with the current mix of generation, there was benefits for greenhouse gas. The only comment I'd like to make, if I, if I may, um, as we talked about simplicity, I agree that as we move towards our Chevy Volt, for example, our eFlex system, it does get more simpler when it comes to the control system, but we need the technology breakthroughs in order to realize that simplicity, and that's why we have to keep focused on ensuring that we've got that technology breakthrough in our advanced battery technology area. So I like the end game, but we've got to make sure that we make you know, the appropriate steps as we move forward and providing some uh, additional support in the advancement of batteries will allow us to get to that very more simplistic uh, end game. Ms. Ziegler. 
Southern California Electric or Edison is uh, leading the charge to develop plug-in hybrid, hybrid vehicles, and you signed some important partnerships in this area. Companies like Ford and Johnson Controls. Other than signing memorandums of understanding with car companies and battery manufacturers, what are the next steps in using these partnerships to advance technologies? I think what we will get out of these partnerships is exactly what my two colleagues were talking about, which is getting vehicles tested with real people out in real circumstances. So when we get the Ford vehicles delivered to us, we will put them in our fleet, we will put them out with some customers, and we will test them in real circumstances looking at the recharging cycles and the discharge. So the benefit of that is getting cars in the fleet, getting them tested. The other things that we're working on is, and you, you've heard talk today about the smart grid of the future, um, is looking at what are the kinds of standards and controls that you're going to want to have. When we talk about that the electricity grid can charge most of these vehicles, you need to charge them off-peak. We have excess capacity on the grid for California that's typically at night. So what you want to have is the intelligence either in the car, in the smart meter, or in the grid that can tell the car that you only wanted to charge at night. So another benefit of these partnerships is really looking at what are the kinds of standards and controls that we need to develop between all of the industries to make that happen and use the electric grid to the benefit as opposed to just adding more on-peak load by charging the vehicles. What's the timeline? To do something. Um, the timeline for the first, which is the demonstration, um, we will get some vehicles next year and begin demonstrating those. Um, I, I hesitate to speculate on the timeline for the, the smart grid. Um, I think we are experimenting now with a, one circuit, which we call our Avanti circuit, which is a, a test of a smart grid. and. So we need to test that and see the results. And then you're looking at um, a huge infrastructure across the United States. So to replace that infrastructure with a smart grid technology is at least a couple decades, I would think, if not more, to really replace all of the electric grid with, the, with smart grid capability. All of you to comment on. We talk about the importance of building up a domestic manufacturing base for uh, an advanced battery industry, but what does this really mean for your respective sectors and the United States as a whole? Why should domestic auto manufacturers not outsource part of the industry to Asia buy cheap components from an established battery sector? If I could start, please. Um, every single program that we have, we made up with a supplier, and there's learnings that go, that, that happen. And that learning on how does the customer use their vehicle, and, and as, as, as every one of us are in here, there are those many different means by which a person drives a vehicle. And that learning loop is so important, and how we characterize it, how we standardize those, um, th those driving operations, and then give that to a supplier to make your system they are learning from you. And every time they do that, they're getting better and better at doing that. If we do that with all of our non-domestic companies, they become smart. They will stay smart, and we will continue to send information that way. I think it's very important that we establish within our own country that learning opportunity. The learning opportunity to make energy storage devices the technology to build the manufacturing tools. There's tool makers out there that are all outside of the United States. There are uh, chemists, there are companies that make all kinds of powders and things like that for, for energy storage devices that are all outside of the United States. If we don't retain that knowledge here, every single vehicle that we build, all the knowledge on how we operate and how we advance that technology goes away and does not stay here in the United States. So I think it's extremely important that we establish that capability, that competence here in the States so that we can retain that knowledge, so that we can have jobs here for our folks and we begin being, if you will, sending information or sending, sending parts the other way. So it's extremely important that we, as, as OEMs, 
partner up with companies and have the ability to have that knowledge here. And we can only get it by uh, increasing our focus on manufacturing of energy storage devices, high-tech systems here in the States, because it is an art and it's also a science. In terms of, uh, let's talk about hybrids first. The market is and is going to continue to stay here in the United States. We are the largest consumers of hybrid vehicles in the world, and it's projected that we're going to continue to be doing that. So if you, you, you start with that premise, it seems to make sense that you want to create the jobs here where you're going to be selling them. We can assemble them here, we can manufacture them here, and we can sell them here. Um, I would also let you know that hybrid vehicle technology originated here in the United States. And if you take a look at what happened, we're absolutely getting decimated in the marketplace with technology that we invented here. And I, I, I'm not going to repeat what Denise said, but I think she summed it up exactly right. We have an opportunity here to take advantage of a, of a market that wants hybrids and, and we'll, we'll accept them with some help from the government, of course. We can create jobs. We can create the infrastructure. We can pull through our universities and through our schools a desire and a sexiness for kids to embrace science and technology instead of becoming day traders. We can then become exactly what we're seeing happen everywhere else in the world where we have to go and export. And from a purely practical standpoint, every time we do a hybrid vehicle right now, we have to go to Japan, China, or Europe to get all of our components. It takes a lot longer for us to get a vehicle on the road if we're all traveling all over the world to get these components, you know, engineered and, and manufactured. So what's the state of the and development of, 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 a, of a domestic supply chain for the battery? We battery don't have one. Period. We don't have one. And, and I would, I don't think you know this, but um, the facility that I have in Milwaukee, the Jets Controls facility, is the only facility outside of Japan that has complete capability to do cell research, cell prototype manufacturing, and systems engineering. It is the only one outside of Asia. That's, that's a real commentary on what's happened to our ability to, to not only have the basic science, but the capability to produce. We do not have a single supplier here in the United States. Ms. Ziegler, would you like to add? I would just add one thing. I think, uh, as we talked about earlier, um, we are looking at plug-in hybrids in this technology to really get ourselves off of imported oil. So doesn't it make sense to try to use United States manufacturers to make the replacement for imported oil? And I would, I would really echo as well, um, we as the United States really need to have good jobs for our people that provide good wages. And I think being able to manufacture technology in the United States is critically important. What are, what are other countries doing to increase their own capabilities? Uh, to, as we perhaps develop that, they'll stay uh, competitive. Uh, what, what, what kind of comment would you have about that? Well, uh, I think it starts first in um, the structure of the society. Um, if you take a look anywhere but in the United States, they encourage um, uh, science and technology in the school systems. They're supported from a government level, the industries as well as the universities to advance their technology. Um, so I, I think there just starts a fundamental uh, infrastructure inside of, you know, inside of these countries that we just don't have here to encourage um, building up that capability. And if you take a look at what's happening, let's just use Europe as an example. They, are, they have a plethora of activity going on, not only in diesels, but in hybrids, because they know for the 2012 Kyoto Protocol, diesels alone are not going to get them to the levels that they need to be at. So what they're going to do is, and we'll produce the batteries, sell the vehicles over here, we'll make sure that it's accepted and we'll get the technology, and they're going to take it back over there. So that's what's happening in the world right now. Just to add another comment, um, I think we need to more focused, a more focused effort between government and industry here in the United States in order to advance that technology. You're absolutely right. We have efforts in place, DOE, USABC, we've been doing some things thus far, but if we're going to stay in this league, 
we're going to have to make a step change in our efforts, in our funding efforts, in our focus efforts, as we industry come together. And it's amazing how um, GM has a, a collaboration with Ford and Chrysler. Um, uh, for, from my USABC. We also have collaborations with BMW as well as DCX because the answer is everybody sees this is where we have to do. We have to advance the technology in this area and collaborations are occurring. I think we as a, from, from a government perspective, we need to step up our game in that area as well. Japan has a huge, a huge step up in this where they've combined very effectively their government, their industry, as well as their, their universities in, in, in developing not just nickel metal hydride but also lithium and the next generation lithium because the answer isn't just with one. You've got to have that business plan to allow you to continue to sustain that to understand what the next one is and the next one is in order to bring the cost down because if you stay in the startup mode, which I feel we are in at this point from a, from a, from a U.S. government, from an industry, we're still at that very infancy of, of being able to bring advanced battery technology to fruition. If we just stay there, the cost will never be there and we'll be left behind because we'll kind of stay in that do loop of trying to continue to do the research but really not get the learning cycles, the quick learning cycles, put it in vehicles, put it in demonstration vehicles where we can learn because, like I said, every one of us drive differently. There's things that we know today and there's things yet to be learned tomorrow, but if we don't have those demonstration uh, opportunities, we won't learn them. And then again, the cost is going to be high in the beginning and collectively with government, we're going to have to lower that so that we can get more product out there in the real consumer's hands so that we can learn more and then bring those costs down. English, I have well overstayed my <laughs> welcome. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll, I don't know that I'll use all the five minutes, but here's the uh, um, if I wanted to go from here to buy a plug-in hybrid, can I get one? Who would I, who would I call? <laughs> who would I call? You, you can't get one from an OEM today that has been completely integrated, that's been completely tested, that will last the expectation 10 years. You won't have to service it. We're not, just, we're not ready yet. There's still a lot of work to be done. You can buy demonstration kinds of things where it's in there, it won't, won't last forever, but yet it allows you to have some demonstration uh, opportunities. So I could get a kit, right, for a, for, uh, for a, uh, a Prius. I, I guess I can buy that. I could go online and find a kit. Well, I'm not advertising. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take care of that one soon. Yeah. I'm not even associated. Yes, there are what we call garage conversions. Mm -hmm. um, I would just uh, caution you, however, if you're personally thinking about doing that, one, you invalidate your uh, automotive warranty, oh, yeah. and number two, it, it, Denise is absolutely right. The standards and the validation that we have to uh, undergo as an industry are beyond anything anybody, except if you're in that industry, understands. And so these conversions do not are not intended to meet those validation, those useful life, those reliability, and potentially um, unintended consequences. So I would, I would just encourage you to wait because she's going to be out very soon with one. So we'll be soon. Yeah, we're, we're, we're currently working on a plug-in hybrid right now with, for a Saturn, Saturn View. Saturn View. Jonathan Control Staff is one of the advanced uh, technology suppliers that we're working collectively on. But we've got to make sure that under all kinds of conditions, this vehicle is safe in a crash condition that, that the, 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 the occupant is not hurt. We've got to make sure that it lives and lasts. You don't want to go and, re, and replace your battery every 600 miles because right. it failed. So we are working towards coming up with a real certified plug-in vehicle that will allow us to, again, sell it to the, the, the customer and it meets your needs. 
And when, when, when is the projected delivery? We haven't put a production date on that we can announce to the public, although internally i got a production date <laughs> that I've got to make sure that I line everything up and work as hard as I possibly can to uncover and to deal with all of those engineering issues in order to make this, this program feasible. You encourage me that, it's, that it's, it's that, it's engineering, it's standards, it's not the price of gasoline. Is that right? Or is it also some concern about whether the price of gasoline goes down and when it goes down, do, do I really want to buy one or do I just decide I'll keep on driving what I got? As an OEM, I wish I can predict which vehicles you'll buy and at uh, what price yeah. you'll buy them. I can't do that. But my obligation is to get the technology out there certified so that you can have the opportunity in order to accomplish that. And, and you know what we have to do is, uh, in absence of mandates, um, we have to drive the market pole. And I think Denise said it very well that it is going to be a collaboration. We have to have continued and continued improved collaboration with government. The vision is at some point, hopefully in the next couple of years, you're going to go to the dealership and when you choose whether you want leather or your recyclable seats, you can then check off a plug-in option or another hybrid option, and it will be some reasonable incremental cost that you see the value being there and that Denise and, and my industry can have a profitable growth plan. That is what we're working towards, but we can't do it at the volumes we're at now, the lack of standards, and the lack of, co of real collaboration in terms of driving scale and infrastructure here in the United States. So if we really want to drive this, mandates may be a good idea, huh? In other words, fuel efficiency standards might be a good idea. Uh, you can address it in a number of ways. It can be fuel efficiency or I would um, uh, certainly the shift in discussion to carbon mandates. Yeah, um, which is helpful on your chart that you had both of those, either carbon uh, kind of systems or a fuel efficiency standard. I mean, it's a good argument that perhaps that might really get us going, huh? Without a doubt. And, I'm, and what you saw in that chart represented CO2. When you add in all the other forms of greenhouse gases, it only gets better as you increase your level of hybridization. And so just to refresh your memory, I, you know, I would very much encourage that we, we continue to exploit the technology that we have available today, that we can put on the road today, but we're not in the volumes as well as continue to invest in what is hopefully going to be near-term plug-in capability and eventually EV. And one last question. We, the, um, I guess my time, I have used all the time, Mr. Chairman, is we've got enough raw materials to do these batteries, right? It's not like that they're made out of platinum and there's only so much in the world and, and that means that we really can't use these or... It's not a resource no, problem, right? That, that's correct. There's enough lithium, there's enough it, whatever else. We can't divulge the recipes because that is our, our intellectual right. you know, property. But um, you know, clearly, the, the materials are always a concern. But versus, and, and, as Denise said, when you look at nickel metal hydride versus a lithium ion, first because it's 50% lighter, you're using consuming less materials. And one of the areas that I would encourage additional research beyond where we are today is alternate materials that take all the, the variability in terms of market spikes as well as availability. And they're, they're there, they're on the horizon, and we're working with them. So we're going to continue to experiment with our recipes to ensure that we meet all of, of the requirements from our automotive manufacturers. But I think there's a lot of, of opportunity for us to continue to take that, that volatility out and still deliver all the performance. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. I'd like to go another 20 minutes. <laughs> Good afternoon. It's fascinating, uh, and, and y'all have been great. Thank you very, very much. So we appreciate your appearing before our subcommittee, and under the rules of this committee, the record will be held open for two weeks for members to submit additional statements, and any additional questions that they might have for the witnesses, we'll send them to you. This hearing is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.